Thank you for that kind introduction. All right. And I have to speak about the photo. It wasn't quite me, but you can see me in person. <laughs> I think the photo was of someone else. Uh, but again, <laughs> thank you for this uh, opportunity to be able to speak at, at this conference. And uh, so far, it's been really, really inspiring. And um, the topic I'll cover is around the mental health challenges among women um, living with HIV in Africa. And a lot of the things that I'm going to speak about have actually been said, especially by the first speakers, the ones who talked about the lived experiences, the stigma, the discrimination. That's essentially what I'm going to touch on. We'll listen to that a little bit more, but we can have moments to discuss, maybe even after the sessions. So I hope you'll still stay engaged. I know lunch is a huge issue, but I didn't see you girl in the menu, so I think we are home dry. We'll get there. Okay, so that's my overview. That's what I'll talk about. But in the interest of time, I think I'll move forward. Um, so uh, we've had, uh, I mean, many, many studies have shown that mental health conditions are actually higher among women living with HIV compared to men living with HIV and also compared to uh, HIV negative women. Uh, uh, the WHO uh, platform has shown that HIV negative women have depression levels, for example, at 5.9 percent. That's a prevalence, uh, as compared to a systematic review that recently was recently published and found depression levels among women living with HIV to, to range between 5.9 percent in Nigeria to 61 percent in Uganda. Yeah. Anxiety levels are also just as high. In Ethiopia, they're found to be uh, at about 28.9%, and in Uganda, 61%. So depression and anxiety are the commonest uh, mental health disorders that are found in this particular population, uh, women living with HIV. But aside from that, we have other disorders. For example, post-traumatic stress disorders. We've talked a lot about uh, trauma, and also uh, substance use-related disorders. So how do mental health disorders affect HIV management? Because now we are here to see the integration and the intersection of HIV and mental health. What, what really should we be thinking about when we're managing uh, um, in the HIV management when it comes to mental health disorders? So, um, and this again has been mentioned a lot. Usually when people have uh, mental health uh, disorders, for example, I'll give an example of depression. They present with symptoms like fatigue, like uh, hopelessness, and that kind of apathy leads to episodes of forgetfulness or just intentional non-adherence. So you have to manage the depression, have to manage the, the, the lady, be able to talk to the lady and be able to find a place whereby they are uh, you manage the depression and they're more motivated to actually take the medication. So I look at, <coughs> excuse me, the adherence is affected because of the symptoms themselves. Anxiety as well, even with anxiety, the focus is, goes low and it's harder to stay ad uh, adherent to the medication. Um, other illnesses, for example, depression again has impacts on cognitive functioning, that is memory impairment, concentration and decision making uh, capacity is also impaired in these uh, uh, patients. So that impaired ability to understand and follow complex treatment plans. As you've seen, usually we, with the HIV treatment, the ARVs plus maybe other multimorbidity uh, treatments that people are taking, it's not usually just one medica medication. So there's a lot to remember and there's a lot of complex treatment plans. So that cognitive functioning has to really be, th uh, be thought through and that has an effect on adherence as well. Then again, back to the combination of medication, maybe if the woman is on an antidepressant and also on ARVs, there's that multiple medication. Someone already talked about the pill burden that comes about and that uh, medication, multiple medication might lead more to drug interactions causing adverse effects. When the woman is going through adverse effects, there's a higher likelihood that adherence will also be impacted. Uh, the other issue is around increased risk behaviors. Again, um, uh, mental health disorders, for example, depression, can lead to uh, the use of substances as a way of self-medicating to treat, uh, to manage the symptoms of depression, for example. And this in itself can exacerbate HIV transmission and progression. 
So again, this is something that has been repeated again and again on stigma and discrimination. These are risk factors that contribute to mental health disorders among women living with HIV. The stigma, the discrimination, trauma has been mentioned, as well as socioeconomic factors. But what is key is that these factors tend to intersect a lot. So it's not that we, there's no intervention that we should just manage stigma and forget about the trauma, or trauma and forget about the socioeconomic aspects. So they are intersected and uh, interconnected. So it's important to look at them as a, a package rather than one particular item. So we'll move on to the stigma, although this has been mentioned again and again. As we first, we heard from our f uh, first speakers that um, there's a lot that has been done in the HIV space around stigma and discrimination, especially about misconception about HIV transmission. I think we've come a long way. Fear of contagion, we've come a long way. That's not such a big issue. But then I think the aspects of moral judgment associated with drug use and sex work, that still, still tends to be there. And then this also leads to that stigmatizing behavior of healthcare providers as well as family members. And that leads to a lot of social isolation, rejection, and internalized stigma for the women. And that has a negative impact on the mental health. Uh, the other aspect is trauma. Trauma, we've talked about physical, excuse me, physical, sexual, uh, intimate partner violence, as well as child abuse, leading to higher risk, rates, uh, risk of PTSD, depression, anxiety, and other mood disorders, for example, uh, bipolar mood disorder. So uh, both the trauma itself, the exposure to trauma, as well as having these uh, mental disorders also increases the risk of uh, risky behaviors. For example, the use of substances that I mentioned earlier as a way of self-medicating or just as a reaction to the trauma itself, as a way of trying to forget. But more importantly, there's also the difficulties forming trusting relationships. When there's no, that connection is missing, then there's a higher chance of mental health uh, issues being exacerbated. Then the socioeconomic, I think we've also looked at it, but that economic uh, instability really limits the woman's ability to afford necessities such as food and the medication, even afford tr uh, tr uh, transport to go get the treatment that she requires. So a lot of these women would complain about, I have a lot of stress, I'm dealing with a lot of stress and anxieties, which again compounds the mental health challenges. So what can we do to address these mental health needs within the HIV care space? There are a number of strategies that have been uh, you know, tried out. They are still being tried out for integrating mental health services in HIV care settings. Uh, I'll go through each a uh, little bit in more detail. Screening and assessment, this has become part of the, the standard HIV care protocol. And I'm really glad that right now depression screening seems to be standard protocol. Uh, anxiety seems to be a uh, standard protocol, but I think one of the issues that really is of concern is the regularity of the intervals of screening. It tends to be maybe during the initial intake, but very less so during routine medical visits or even when there's a change in clinical status. And that should be even a, you know, a warning sign when there's a change in clinical status, the more reason why you need to screen this lady for depression or anxiety or PTSD or other traumatic related uh, disorders. Now the other intervention that has been tried out is adopting collaborative care models where we have uh, multidisciplinary teams looking from primary care providers, mental health specialists, social workers, as well as peer support networks, uh, peer support workers working together, and they facilitate communication, coordination, and continuity of care across the different healthcare providers and settings. Some people think that this is something that is you know, pricey or resource intensive, but to, to be honest, it really depends on the kind of cadre of staff that you have. As long as you assign someone who will look at the mental health aspects, the primary co provider looks at a different aspect or the social worker also looks at the social work uh, perspective. I think it's something that can be done even in, in low middle income countries and there's a lot of work going on in that. The other aspect is training and capacity building for healthcare providers. These are front care health providers, the health providers who don't have specialization even in uh, mental health, they should be trained on how to identify, how to assess, and how to manage mental health disorders among persons living with HIV. One of the important trainings is around, around cultural competence, so that uh, empathy, that respect for a woman's culture and where she's coming from and what she to incorporate mental health curriculums in the trainee program 
and also continuous education programs. Then there's task shifting and task sharing. We'll never have enough workforce as mental health specialists. of um, uh, a participatory program when you're coming up with uh, evaluating or implementing services for mental, uh, for mental health services as well as HIV services in a particular space. It's in important that the community members, persons living with HIV are part of the planning, part of the implementation, and part of the evaluation of these particular uh, services that we want to implement, just to make them more accessible and more feasible and more sustained actually. More, more acceptable, more feasible and more sustained. We've talked about peer support networks. Uh, I think Angelina mentioned about how she managed to actually you know, be, be able to cope because there was someone else and then she was a part of a group. So peer support networks are extremely crucial even for mental well-being. Uh, essentially they offer that psychosocial support. They, off, they reduce a lot of isolation. They, re they promote resilience. They deliver peer counseling, you can get peer counseling within the peer support networks, and they also facilitate uh, that kind of support group. You feel like you're not alone, and more importantly, also the advocacy happens you, within those peer support networks, so they are really critical. Uh, we have a number of projects that are going on currently, and also others that have already been published. I think the photo, many of you know the Friendship Bench for Zimbabwe. From, it started out in Zimbabwe, it's now gone all over the world, really, about um, mothers, grandmothers providing problem-based uh, kind of therapy, uh, problem-solving therapy to women who are going through depression. And it's been very, very successful to the point of it's even being done, let's say, in New York. So it's something that can, has been shown to be work and be scaled up. One of the studies we did, the one uh, on interpersonal psychotherapy, did the MIND study. It was on women who've experienced gender-based violence, uh, HIV positive women who've experienced gender-based violence and who are managing them for depression and, and PTSD. And at the end of the day, we managed to, uh, tra to train non-specialists to provide IPT, that interpersonal psychotherapy, and it did have good, very good results. So we've even scaled up that particular intervention. Then we were talking about aging in this particular uh, uh, you know, module, this particular meeting. So um, I think it's important to also address these aspects of aging in women living with HIV. And someone even actually asked about this in the morning session. There's the aspect of uh, HIV-associated neurocognitive uh, disorders. They are prevalent among older adults living with HIV, and they can have a range from just mild to very severe. 
And uh, I mean, those functions are, are, are implicated. So it's important, again, the cornerstone is really managing them with the ARVs, but at the tail end of severe dimension, then caregiver support is extremely important. There's polypharmacy, we've already talked about that. The fact that there's multimorbidity, maybe they're dealing with uh, diabetes, hypertension, and then antidepressants. So that polypharmacy, you have to watch out for drug interactions. Then there's that social isolation and loneliness. A lot of these women may have lost their loved ones. And so that loss of uh, that social support network, so that can worsen mental health issues, and so, as well as financial insecurity and retirement issues. So for future directions, it's important to, for the, especially the aspects of aging, to conduct longitudinal studies to be able to better understand aging and its impact on women living uh, with HIV from the physical and also the uh, mental health as well. These integrated care models, we need more research on them in different settings to see what actually works in these specific uh, settings in terms of implementation effectiveness and even the as assessed aspects of treatment adherence and viral suppression. Once we put in this integrated model, what effect does it have on uh, adherence and viral suppression at the end of the day? Then policy and systems research is extremely important and it's possible to, it will be important to explore policy frameworks, for example, financing mechanisms. If we were to integrate these uh, models, what would it cost? What would it cost the taxpayer for, for us to do this integration, and um, workforce capacity, as well as how to strengthen these particular systems. These aspects are extremely important. So in conclusion, um, mental health issues are common among women uh, with HIV in Africa, and they affect both the physical and the mental well-being. Uh, there are a number of challenges. They've been mentioned again and again, again and again. Stigma, discrimination, socioeconomic issues, especially worse and mental health problems and they also limit access to care. So it's important that whatever interventions are put in place, they're put in place as a package because of the inter interconnections of these particular challenges. Then combining mental health services with HIV care is crucial for better outcomes. It's not just enough to look at just you know, ARVs only, it's important to look at the mental health aspects as well. So screening, collaborative care, training, and technology can help integrate these mental health services more effectively in these spaces. And then also uh, related to aging, addressing unique challenges of aging with HIV really requires comprehensive, uh, personal centered care and one that integrates medical, psychosocial, as well as community-based support services. I think that's it. Thank you so much for your attention.